right, we're going to jump into some announcements. I, I just want to say, I woke up with, with heartburn this morning, and Carla Johnson brought me something green to drink. And I blame her for why I'm so emotional already this morning. I don't know what she put in that stuff, um, but it tasted good. It tasted like gin. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. No, no, I'm kidding. Just joking there. So, listen, it's good to see you guys this morning. Um, it, is, it is good to be part of a church where, I mean, God just moves. And, and that's really an amazing thing, an amazing thing that we get to be a part of. And I just want to run through some quick announcements with you. We are a church to call home, a family to call your own. If you're new here, uh, we consider you family. We take this idea of family really seriously. And we take this idea that this could be a, a place to call home for you just really seriously. And so we're a friendly church that hopes to just inspire you to seek Jesus. And so now outside of that, we've got about a million things going on, like a, a million things happening. And I'm going to give you just enough information to remember them, but not actually to know when or what time it is, because I want to make sure that you reach out to our, our WhatsApp number to get all the information uh, that you need. Because if I were to do it all, it would, just, it would take 20 minutes up here. So we're going to rapid fire through some, some slides here. So the first one we've got up here, we've got Precept. This is a Bible study that happens. If you want to know more about your Bible, if you want to know more about uh, God's Word and what it says, come to Precept. It's on Tuesdays at 7, starting February 7th, here at the church. There's numbers you can call and get in touch with people. We've also got a women's group uh, that's meeting. It is called Women Connect. If you make a mistake and call this Women's Connect, then, and you're me, then you get in major trouble. This is Women Connect. It's a four-week study of Psalm 90. They did one of these last year. It was just transformational for every woman that came. I mean, it was absolutely unbelievable. And that starts on the 1st of February at 9.30 a.m. And then this Friday night, I do want to spend a little bit of extra time on this. We've got kids stuff. Uh, we've got a movie night tonight or on, on Friday. It starts at 6 p.m. Friday the 3rd. This is one of the most fun nights that we can have at church. It's when we bring all our kids from Upstreet and, and even younger kids and even older kids and even just families that don't have kids will come to these things. But, but come, bring a blanket. We're going to watch a movie together and just spend time fellowshipping as a family. And this kind of kicks off our year of kids stuff. Last year, we ended up, uh, we made it a goal that we wanted to have over 100 kids coming to kids stuff. And last year, that, that was what we, we got to, 100 kids every Friday, or once a, once a month on a Friday night coming into this building um, and just getting taught about Jesus in a fun way. It's just absolutely incredible. Uh, and then the next slide for you, we've got a communion Sunday, 5th of February. For those of you that like to participate in that, that's Friday, February 5th. And then we have uh, this Better Business Cohort. This is run by uh, one of our, our, our great members, a guy named Neil Green. And uh, he's just an amazing guy with a ton of, of knowledge. And he just has a heart that we gather around and we learn how to do business together and business better. And he's got a story that he wants to, to tell and to share. Um, and so this is something we're starting and it'll continue. And so if you're in business, want to know more about business, you want to grow your business, participate in it, have questions about it, this is really the perfect thing for you to attend. And so now if you look at your seats, this is the important thing because if you don't do this, then I can't stand up here. So that's your tithe, right? So everybody's quiet. Yeah, that's great. Uh -huh. Yeah, everybody laughs at Jen and then they're silent when it comes to, to kind of the finance. But listen, when you tithe, it, it's you're saying like, hey, I trust God with my finances and also I believe in the mission and vision of South Point Church. It's, you know, it's giving God your first 10% and then watching God bless the, the other 90. And when you give to us, that's why we get to do the things that we get to do here. Because this church is so generous. And it really is an extremely, extremely generous church. So these are all the ways you can do that. And then on the other side, the last couple things I'll tell you is we love to pray. We have a prayer team. You can tell us uh, how we can pray for you. You can tell us prayers that God has answered for you. And then we've got a thing called Next. Authenticity and transparency are huge for us here. If you're new here, and they'll put the slide up here for next. Next is happening on Sunday, the, the 12th of February. We do this once a month. Our church is growing at a rapid pace. We, we were putting 160 chairs out, and then we put 180 out, and then we put 190 out. Now we're putting 200 plus chairs out on a Sunday morning, and, and the place is filling up. And our largest areas of growth are new people inviting new people. 
And this is, this is why we do this. It's for you. We want to be authentic and transparent about who we are and why we do the things that we do. And that, that's exactly what it is. It happens after a service, and it, it's a conversation. It's a place for you to ask questions and a place for us to just to talk and connect with you. And then lastly here, I've got um, uh, the, the, the community group aspect here. But really, this is for the whole church. So we're starting a series, and we started today. It's called Irresistible, and it, it has a sort of a Thursday night component that we're doing with it. And, and we want to know why, it, it's, why we serve an irresistible church, an irresistible God, and why there is an irresistible love. And that's what we're going to be talking through over the next couple of weeks. But I thought, let's also tie it in, because community groups are starting. And so our, our value in community, and this may be different from other churches, is that every single person is in community with somebody else. It, okay, it's that simple. It's not any more complicated than that. So we've made it so easy, not only for our group leaders and our groups to come the first or every Thursday of February and, and just get an opportunity to hang out with new people, meet new people, but this is also for those of you looking for community and you haven't found it yet. We set tables out, we have fun, we play a game, we go through some material. It's an awesome night, but I, I want to see you there. I'd like to see as many people there as possible. And now the most important slide that I would put on the screen is, is this number here, our WhatsApp number. So this goes to a telephone that I'm in possession of. Okay, it goes to me. And this week, I've even had people ask questions on there, and it was, it was great to respond back and give answers and clarity. If you send a message to this number, and you tell me your name and say, hey, I want to be on the broadcast list, then all the announcements I just gave, you get in a beautifully presented... I spent four hours this week working on a beautiful presentation of announcements. Uh, Yannette, who does our graphics, she spent who knows how many hours doing graphics. So basically, if you don't sign up for this, you're saying you don't like your pastor, okay? <laughs> you're saying you just don't like me, you don't like the effort that I put into it, you know? No, I'm, I'm just trying to guilt you into this. But, but the, the constant thing, just a little inside baseball here, behind the scenes, it's really hard to let everyone know what we're doing. And so we're trying to figure out how do we let everyone know? You know, how do we get the information out there? And so r really our open rate is the best here. It's better than email. It's better than anything else. Uh, the retention rate of information is better here than making an announcement on Sunday. But so anyway, it's 079-911-5552. If you put that number in your phone, you send a WhatsApp, you say, hey, my name is Mike Peltrit. I'd like for you to add me three times so that I get three times the messages, then I will, we will do that and make sure you get that. So, all right, I'm ready to get started with the message today. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, this year as I started praying about what it is, and really I started probably last year praying about what it is that, that we as a church are, are looking at as a season and what it is that we're, we're getting ready to head into. And then as I start to see what God is doing here in this building, and I, and I think, okay, you know, the, the seats are filling up. People are coming. Family Ministries is growing. We had over 30 kids on Friday night at our first Inside Out, which is our high school gathering. Yeah, I know exactly. We've just got some amazing things happening around here. And plus, with all the new growth, with all the new people that are coming, I just thought, man, we need to understand what it is that we're doing here. We need to know why we are at church. We need to know why we call this thing good. See, I, I have this idea. That I don't ever want to take for granted that just because I stand up here, or actually I don't ever want to be entitled to think that just because we're here, you need to believe what we say. See, I think you should have the right to understand why you believe it, or even have the right to say, I believe it, or I don't believe it. And so what I wanted to do is say, okay, let's develop this series here, and then let's tie it in with the thing on Thursday nights. But let's try and wrap the whole church into this idea of what it means to be irresistible. Now, irresistible is a, is a broad word, and it means a bunch of different things. But for this series, we're specifically focus on, focusing on these three things. It's, it's an irresistible church, an irresistible Jesus, and an irresistible love. And, and as I was looking at, at what it is that we can do as a series and what is it we can do, you know, as a church, God put it on my heart. He, he really did. He put it on my heart. He said, Chris, what, what if people knew what it was like to go to an irresistible church? And the church is not the building. The church is you guys. 
I mean, this morning, it's already been irresistible to me. I had somebody bring me medicine, you know, up here crying with smiley, listening to you guys work. I mean, this is the best day of the week for me. It's amazing. But, but then what, what, what is it like to serve an irresistible Jesus? Jesus was crazy irresistible. But most of us don't know that. And that's okay. I can tell you about that. And then an irresistible love. I mean, that's what we crave all the time from everyone anyway. And so if we come out on the other side of the series, being able to answer these three things and being able to know why we call this place irresistible and what it is that makes it irresistible, then I believe that, that we're going to grow more. And why is it that we want to grow more? Well, because there's more people out there that need the love of Jesus. Let's never stop pursuing that. As long as somebody in Cape Town and South Africa and beyond and all over the world still needs an opportunity to have an encounter with God, let's just keep going. Let's just not stop. And so that, that's why we're, we're, we're uniting around this. So we would call this like an alignment series. So we're, the whole church is getting together to learn this. So let me give you the definition of irresistible. This is an interesting definition. It's, it, irresistible means impossible to refuse, oppose, or avoid because it is too pleasant, attractive, or strong. All right, I'll say that one more time. Impossible to refuse oppose or avoid because it's too pleasant, attractive, or strong. So I'll give you guys an example here. So one, one example of something being irresistible is this picture here. You know, when, when Krispy Kreme showed up, everyone was like, oh, we got American donuts. They're amazing. Listen, I don't know. I don't remember the name of the place, but it's in the mall. It's in Century City, and it's next to Marcel's ice cream, and they sell those little sugar donuts there. Come on, you know, you know, that, I mean, that, that's it right there. That's irresistible to me. Now, this next one may end up splitting the church a little bit. Yeah, come on. But yeah, okay. You know what this is? It's a coo sister, right? Right? Did, did I say that correct? No, no. So, okay, I've been told something very different here. This, this to me is is the real deal this is what i love okay now josh put the next picture up here this okay this is where the church divides because half of you like the other one and half of you like you know like this one right here so is this the coo sister cook sister see you're all saying different stuff anyway you guys don't even know what these things are all I know is that, they're, that, is that they're both amazing, and I, I love them both. But if I had to choose, if I had to choose from one or the other, it wouldn't be this one. It would be the one. It'd be the one before. Amen. 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 Uh, and if we're talking about irresistibility, another thing that we can't leave out is is money. You know, this is hey, this is something you know that we all pursue you know we're, we're ir it's, it's something that's irresistible that we want it drives a lot of our decision making our desires and then kind of the last slide I have for you here this is a selfie that I took last weekend <laughs> yeah yeah this is uh this is, yeah this is Ted right here is a pet shark now this is uh, this is people that actually find it irresistible to, to seek out ad adventure and to seek out adrenaline. And then they really do um, seek those things out. I love seeking out adrenaline and stuff, but usually above the ocean line. But there's people that, that like this in here, you know, as well. And so, and, and then something else that was really interesting is as I was, you know, Googling around and trying to figure out, you know, what's irresistible, what are the most irresistible things, what, you know, just finding out, you know, what the algorithm was going to put up. I could not find a single thing other than these, these two things. And it was, it was how, how men can make themselves more irresistible to women, how women can make themselves more irresistible to men. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm 10, 11 pages into the Google search, and that's still all the articles that I'm getting. And, and these article titles, you know, they sound something, you know, like this. Top 10 ways you can make yourself irresistible to him. These are the top ways to perfect your irresistible look. See, it, it was interesting that, that when I thought, okay, let me Google what's irresistible. I thought that I would get other stuff. But, but it was this. 
You know, it just tells me the, the value of our, of our society and the culture that we live in today. It's so important that, that we find ourselves to be irresistible, meaning that someone can't avoid us. That, that it's like we want, we want this attention. And we'll do whatever it is that we can get this attention. And so th- th- this idea of irresistibility, you know, maybe it's got like a, a toxic, you know, edge to it. I know I started off talking about it being a good thing. But maybe it has a little bit of toxicity to it. And so I, I found another definition. I love this definition because I like the last line in the definition. Irresistible. Something that is so enticing, attractive, magnetic, which is all those articles that are telling men how to do it and women how to do it. That's what we want to be. We want to be enticing. We want to be attractive. We want to be magnetic. We want to be tempting or, or alluring. Ladies with your eyeshadow, you want to tempt, allure. I'm filtering right now. There's things in my, in my, in my head. That I'm like, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. Don't say that, don't say that. But, but we want this. But what, what gets me on this definition is that you have no control against it. Okay, see the irresistible things, it's like we, we have no control against something that we find irresistible. And so, so th- this, this doesn't sound great. In fact, as I was doing research on this, I, I thought, man, this is, this is kind of like a hard topic to talk about and a hard topic to flesh out because eventually we're going to end up in a good place with this. But if I look at the definition and I look online and I do research and I study and I find out what people are saying about it, I, I can't find anything that's really all that great. And in fact, it, to me, there seemed to be something that, that I could not avoid talking about if I'm going to talk about this. And, and see, especially that line, you have no control against it. And I tried to avoid the, the, this other word, and I couldn't. To me, it just felt like that there was this big elephant in the room. You know the saying, you know, where, where you can't avoid the elephant in the room. You have to talk about what the elephant in the room is. And to me, the elephant in the room, and I, I wanted you to see a, a picture with this, because I want you to, to, to couple these two things together, is addiction. See, we think irresistibility and irresistible and this definition that we have for it, but, but that leads to me thinking a lot actually about addiction, especially that line of something that I have no control over. Now, when I type addiction in, that's when I get a lot of, you know, the stuff that you would think about. In fact, the, the, the 10 ways here, the 10 most addictive substances, heroin, cocaine, tobacco, methadone, barbiturates, alcohol, benzos, amphetamines, um, a word I can't say in cannabis. I'll tell you a funny story about amphetamines. I got a raise one time accidentally taking amphetamines. I was, you know, working in construction and I was young. I was just digging ditches and, you know, uh, a guy that I was working with was like, hey, if we take these, you know, these, these pills, these things that, you know, speed up your heart rate, you can work faster, you can get more done. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. I didn't know what, you know, that it was a drug or anything. And after taking these things for like over over a month, my boss is like, you know, he gave me a, a dollar raise on the hour. I thought it was amazing. But then about a month and a half into it, I thought my heart was going to explode. And that's when I found out that this is bad. This is really, really, really bad. It's very bad. See, the, these things, these addictive substances are, are, are really bad things. And when we think about these things, we think about, okay, I have no control over my desire for these things. And then this doesn't even address... The other things like sex and porn and shopping, food, work, exercise, power, you know, the ability to exercise your power over somebody, the ability to exercise control over the people that maybe that work for you or over your family. See, th- these are the things that, that start to be, okay, I have no control over my desire for this. I wish that I could stop looking at porn. I wish I could stop stress spending money. I wish that I could, you know, leave the food alone. I wish I could do all these things, but I just can't. I just can't stop. I can't control. I have no control over it. And so, so this is an important part where I want us to kind of be a little bit introspective. Think, I want you to think about your life. Think about things that you desire that you have no control over. Think about how, how, how actually, when you start to think about the definition of something being irresistible, it's kind of hard to find a good thing to attach to that. It's easy to find things that we're addicted to. 
So, uh, you know, if you could ask yourself this question, it would be, what do you find irresistible and what do you find addicting? It, it, it's, the, it's those two things. And I'll be honest with you, when, when I thought about this, I thought like, man, okay, in my life, what, what, is, what is this? What do I find irresistible? And what do I find addicting? And my list of, of addicting stuff is, you know, long, super long. And my list of, of things that are irresistible, when I really thought about it, it's kind of interesting. Everything that was irresistible, that was good for me, had something to do with a relationship. See, is there at least one thing in your life that you find irresistible that is also good for you? You, you know what I found irresistible to me? It was um, going to God in a quiet time. It, it, it's irresistible because, because I need it. And he's the only one that I believe that can help me in those moments. The other irresistible thing was, was knowing that my wife is there to help and support me and comfort me when I need it. You know, that, that was an irresistible thing that I feel like is, is good. I, I, I want to have no control over my ability to go to God. I want to just be forced by who I am and his nature and my nature to go to him. So it's, it's God's calling that I'm going to say was irresistible. It was the way that God called us, the way that God called people, is what is probably the most irresistible thing. And, I, and I'll explain to you why. So I want to tell you guys a story. So when Casey and I had moved to Cape Town, or before we moved to Cape Town, we came down, we rented a car, we were driving around, and kind of God was setting up our boundaries. We've been called to to, to work in a church, and we, you know, God was kind of saying, okay, I don't want you here, I want you here, you know, we drive, and God said, no, not there, and he's kind of literally setting up an outline for us, and then one day, I, I, I was on a run up on Table Mountain, I stood on Table Mountain, um, and I looked out over the southern suburbs, and I looked out into what would be, you know, UCT in that area, and kind of from, from Pinelands and the blockhouse on the left, all the way over to, to Bishop's Court. And in that area there, God, you know, gave me this vision, this idea, you know, this, this actually was a picture, it's a real picture of, of his hands coming down and his hands just scooping all those people in there and, and just placing them into a church. And then in this church was this light that was coming up out of the, the church and into the sky. And, and to me, that represented just, just people's, people singing praise to God and God's love coming down to them. And I stood there, and I had never had an experience like that before, and I thought, man, that's, that's, that's amazing, God. I literally can, can kind of see your hands just scooping people, just, just dragging, like dragging through the sand and scooping people and just placing them in a church. And so then I turned around, and I started to run back down the trail, and I thought, well, that was so cool to see that, but God, will you also give me like a word? Can you say something to me? He said something really simple to me. He said, if it... If it honors me, I'll fill it. That, that was it. If it honors me, I'll fill it. And so then when I look at the journey of South Point, all the way back to, you know, the, to its inception when it started, Auntie Sheila, what you and, and your generation did to start South Point Church, which at the time was Stellenberg uh, Chapel, correct? And, and what they went through, it was, it was a brethren church, and it transitioned, and it had lots of amazing pastors and leaders way before I came along, and it kind of started to shape and mold into this thing that it is now. And, and there was a guy, John Hastings, who was such a visionary, and he was able to kind of change what was happening here. And then Morgan was such a, a great person to implement and to do and, and to, to really hands-on transition what was happening here. And then Casey and I have come in, and we've been able to play our role. And then I look out here now... And I see, I see all these people out here. You know, post-COVID, there's churches that have had to sell their building, have had to let go of things. But I see the opposite that's happening here. I see growth. I see every month the tithe go up. Every month I see the numbers go up. Every month I hear stories of people having their lives changed and touched by Jesus. Every month somebody says, hey, I actually enjoy uh, coming to church. I actually enjoy inviting people here. And I'm watching like life change. And it takes me back to that moment when I was on the mountain and God said, if it honors me, then I'll fill it. That's why I say that God's calling is irresistible. Because Casey and I, we chased that calling for three years. 
For three years, we couldn't start a church to save our lives. We couldn't get seven people together in a room. God just closed the door, closed the door, closed the door. But we chased it over and over and over again. This irresistible calling of if it honors me, I'll fill it. And then we ended up here at South Point, and, and through circumstances, we're given the opportunity to take over and, and pastor here. And, and now, what I get to say to you guys is that you guys are part of something that's much bigger than yourself. See, when I think about this, this sermon series, why does it matter to you that we're an irresistible church, that we serve an irresistible Jesus, or that we receive an irresistible love? Like, why does it matter? Why, why does that matter to you? It's like we, we want to belong. We want to be a part of something. We want to be a part of a movement. We want to be part of something special. We want to be part of something that's growing, that's alive, not something that's dead and, and barely holding on. And here we are. We're a part of that. Everyone in this room, you're a part of something bigger than yourself. This morning, you could be anywhere on earth. That You could be at the beach. You could be on vacation. You could be at home in bed. You could be sick. You could be anywhere in the world. But you're not. You're here. You're in this room. Why? Why are you here? Why are you in this room? Because I believe that there's something in you that feels like you're a part of something that's bigger than yourself. And there's something irresistible that's building up in you that says on a Sunday morning, I want to go there. I want to be a part of that. I want to subscribe to Chris's broadcast list. I want this. Because it's becoming irresistible. And so what, what, what I heard, and it's like as I was preparing for this, I heard God just kind of nudge me and him say like, hey, hey Chris, hey Chris, I want you to help people understand an, an irresistible church. I want you to help people understand the, this irresistible Jesus and this irresistible love. See that, that again, that God's calling, hey Chris, hey Chris. It just, th that's what was irresistible to me. And I sat with Casey and I sat with other people and I said, well, you know, okay, God's calling me to do this and this irresistible calling because I'm a part of something that's much bigger than Casey and I. And, 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 and that, that calling I can't ignore, but I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to make sure that this matters to other people. I don't know. I, I don't know how to teach you this in a way that you're like, oh yeah, I care about this. But you know what's, you know what's so cool about this? Again, I'm a part of something bigger than myself. Pastor Linton, I don't know if he's in here right now, is a beautiful man with bald head, wears a hat. And Pastor Linton comes to me during the week, and he says, I don't know what God's saying, but God's given me this verse, and I just keep thinking about it, and I don't know what it means for us, but I'm just supposed to share it with you. And then as I was prepping for this message, that verse is what came to mind. And I thought, man, I'm so thankful for people like Linton for sharing what God spoke. Why? Because this is bigger than just me. So it makes it irresistible. So let me show you what Linton shared with me. This is for us. He didn't even know that it was supposed to be for us, but it is for us. So we're going to look in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 54, verses 1 through 2, and it, it says this, and, and, and this is Isaiah talking to Israel. And Israel, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the, the yellow words. So let me just read it to you first. Shout for joy, O barren one, she who has not given birth. Break forth into joyful shouting and rejoice. She who has not gone into labor with child. For the spiritual sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. So what God is saying here is, is God is talking through Isaiah to the people of Israel. And see, a barren woman that could not have a child, she was encapsulated in shame and in guilt. And so God is looking at the people of Israel and saying, you're no longer covered with shame and guilt. You're no longer a barren person. You're no longer uh, unable to produce life, to produce life-giving, fruitful things. So God is telling the people of Israel, your desolation is done. Your barrenness is done. You will be fruitful. You will grow. And in fact, I, I love this part where he says that, that you, that, that, for the spiritual sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman. So what, what God is saying there is that under the new covenant, which I'm giving you through Jesus, there will be more people under the new covenant than there ever was under the old covenant, under the covenant of Moses. 
See, it, it's, God, it's, how irresistible is that? God is saying that when the new covenant comes, when Jesus comes, God's renewing Israel. He's renewing the people. They're no longer barren. They're no, they're no longer unable to produce life and life-giving things. And guess what? There's going to be way more people that are born under, under that covenant than under this, this other one. So we walk around thinking and fearing that our kids and our generations that come behind us are going to deal with, with our life and our sin and our past. And here God is saying, no, it's all done. No longer barren. No longer desolate. There's going to be a bunch of people born into freedom. Now, here is the verse that I'm excited about that Linton gave me. This is for us. He says, Enlarge the site of your tent to make room for more children. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare them. Lengthen your tent ropes and make your pegs, your stakes firm in the ground. So God is saying to Israel, prepare to get bigger. Enlarge your tent. Enlarge the side of the tent. That means go and prepare new ground. That means to make the, the available space for you to put a tent bigger. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you space to make this bigger. You know, stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Make, make what's comfortable bigger because more people are going to come in. Lengthen the tent, the, your, your tent ropes. It's going to grow, guys. It's going to grow. And then he says to, to put your pegs, your stakes firm in the ground. He's talking about foundation there. That way the wind doesn't blow it over. Uh, the world can't knock it apart, but it's there. See, when Linton shared this verse for me, I thought, there's something happening here in this church. There's a movement that's happening here that is irresistible. We just need more people out there to know that it is. But this church is done uh, being barren. I'm not saying that it ever was. But this church, from this day forward, from this moment forward, and even in past moments, we are going to stretch our tents. We're going to lengthen our ropes. We're going to prepare new ground. We're going to open a second service. Then we're going to open a second building. Then we're going to open a third building. We're just going to keep going and going and going. And see, when, when, when Isaiah wrote this verse here, that, I love the study notes here. This is what the study note says to this verse. It says, The present task of God's people is to labor in expectancy and prepare for more people to be added. L labor in expectancy. When you're a door greeter and you greet somebody, labor in expectancy because more people are being added because of how nice you are. When you, wh wherever you serve, whatever you do, whoever you talk to and you have coffee out there, you're laboring in expectancy because we're, we're preparing for more people to be added. If I felt like this church was done growing, Casey and I would be gone. Because the irresistible call on our life is that we never stop introducing people to Jesus. We can never, ever stop. And so Isaiah goes on and, and he says in the next verse, he says, For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will take possession of nations and will inhabit deserted cities. See, everyone right now in South Africa is worried about ESCOM and not having power and not having water and not having all these other things. But you know what I'm going to focus on? I'm going to focus on the fact that our descendants that come through this church and other churches are going to inhabit the city of Cape Town and are going to inhabit the other cities of the world. So this is not a desolate place. This is a blessed place that we're widening the tent, we're widening the tent for. We're stretching for it. And so that's why I can say that, hey, let's learn how to be an irresistible church. Because an irresistible church, an irresistible church that we become is a body of people that, that other people see something so amazing happening that they want to be a part of it. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to break down what that means for us. I want people to see what it is to be serving and to serve and to be served by an irresistible Jesus. Jesus was so cool because Jesus was so irresistible that, that the Pharisees hated him but couldn't leave him alone. And the, the, the people that weren't Jewish, so that'd be everybody else, just wanted to be around him. Jesus was irresistible. That's why I can say that God's calling is the only real irresistible thing that we have. And then, and then we're going to finish the series talking about an irresistible love and how good that is that we get to just abase ourselves in this irresistible love. 
Now, th- this can seem daunting. It can seem like, okay, this is a, a, a big task. And, and even me, I, I'm not sure that I'm communicating it well to you. But I want you to know that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And it's irresistible. That's why people come. That's why people want to be a part of it. And God actually gives encouragement. So if you feel discouraged, if you feel like I keep inviting people, but they don't come, or if you feel like, hey, I'm sitting here and I don't think Jesus is irresistible. I don't think Jesus is, uh, or the church or love is irresistible. Instead, I got all these addictions that I'm dealing with. Well, Isaiah gives even you encouragement here. And, and, And we'll end on these few verses here, but it says, do not fear for you will not be put to shame. No more shame. Who wants that? I'm done carrying shame in my life. Over it, done. And do not fret or feel humiliated or ashamed. No more humiliation for me, please. I'm done. For you will not be disgraced. That means I can't fail because God's doing it. For you will forget the shame of your youth. Man, what if you could just erase all the shame that you ever carried? How irresistible is that? And you will no longer remember the disgrace of your widowhood. That's saying that that season in your life where you were barren and unable to produce fruit, you're not even going to remember what that felt like. And then Isaiah goes on in, in, in verse 10, he says, For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you. Nor will my covenant of peace be shaken, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. How irresistible is it that God's loving kindness can never be removed from us? There's a lot of lonely, hurt people out there that would give anything in the world for love. That's why they're on Google trying to figure out how to be irresistible. And here God is in Isaiah saying, my covenant of peace, my loving kindness will never go anywhere. And then he gives us another verse of encouragement in verse 17. He says, no weapon that is formed against you will succeed. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. This peace, this righteousness, this security and triumph over opposition is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. See, it, it, it's time that we stretch our tents. And, and, and the, the great thing about that is as we look at stretching our tents, I want you guys to know, again, it's bigger than you, it's bigger than me. Someone stretched a tent for you to be here today. See, if God's done anything in your life through, through, this, through this church and this group of people, it's because somebody before you had the faith to believe that they would stretch their tent. And when they stretched their tent, it made space for you to be here. Now, before we go into a, a worship song here, I thought, man, if we're talking about irresistible Jesus, love, irresistible church, all this stuff, that's great, amazing. But there's something that we need to understand about ourselves. And this is actually what had me so emotional because I was sitting backstage while you guys were worshiping, praying over this, and, and, and I knew what was coming at the end of this message, and it just, it just breaks me down, this truth. See, when we talk about irresistibility, the first thing to understand is that you were irresistible to God. See, God never stopped pursuing you. you. You were irresistible to God. When Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, God gave them a way to communicate with him. When Israel sinned, God gave them a way to make sacrifices and have a relationship with them. God sent Moses to free the people. God sent Abraham to create the people. God, God sent Jesus to finally tear the divide that separates us from him. Why? Because you are irresistible to God. And so I'm I'm gonna bow my head, we're gonna pray, the band's gonna come out, lead us in a song. I want you to marinate on that. Before you think about an irresistible church or love or or anything like that, the, the first thing I want you to think about is that you were irresistible to God. Heavenly Father.